Welcome to the, the seminar series, Changes in, in Forest Ecology. Uh, you may have noticed that introductory music we had was from the new world. Well, that's what we're trying to do, a new world. A new world seminar series where not everybody's sitting in the room. It's hybrid. We're using the, the new techniques we've learned to use. And we will invite speakers from all around the world. And we hope to get an audience from all around the world combined with the, the audience that we we have in the room. We have a, a high profile list of speakers for the coming six months. The seminar series runs more or less once a month for one hour in the afternoon in Europe, depending where you are, and obviously in the in the evening if you're in, in the Far East. Today's speaker is Katarina Lapin. She's, she's the head of Department of Forest Biodiversity and Nature Protection at the Federal Research Institute in um, Vienna. She's very much a product of Vienna. She studied in Vienna, studied at Bochum, for some of you who know where, where that is, the University for, for Bold and Couture. But she's been uh, to some very interesting stops in, in her career path, including uh, Cambridge University, but then also places in India. Uh, today, she's, she's going to talk about from policy to practice, implementing forest biodiversity management strategies. My aim today is to show um, the link between, I mean, the title says it all, right? The policy, the link between policies and practice, because I really believe that um, when we do research in the applied field of forest ecology, it's one of the most crucial things to really also do some things with all our uh, results and to communicate them. And sometimes this is harder than actually performing the research. So I will try to loop a little bit between uh, um, between these links um, throughout the presentation, but I'm looking forward to the discussion in the end, and I hope we will have enough time because I have a lot of slides, but I might go quite quickly to, through some of the slides. If you're interested, I'm happy to share them with you afterwards. So let's get it started. I will guide you a little bit through a rough introduction to forest biodiversity, we will discuss some, some European policies and um, talk about the risks and the management strategies before we come to some topics which we are maybe worth discussing. You, you all are aware what forest biodiversity probably is. What's interesting is that uh, it's actually really picked up from the global policies like the Convention for Bio Biological Diversity, there is even um, transnational and international resolutions about the importance of forest biodiversity and um, that it also includes not only the species, like at the species level, let's say the genetic and um, ecosystem diversity, as you might know it already. But I think uh, what's worth highlighting it is that forest biodiversity lives from structure, from a lot of biotic, abiotic factors that shape the habitats. And what's worth uh, mentioning when we, when we, when you deal with forest biodiversity on a daily basis, um, then, then it's 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 a matter on data where you get the data from, and data pretty much shapes um, your possibilities to make conclusions on the status of the forest biodiversity, and also on. Um, how management, forest management, for example, impacts forest biodiversity. So here in this slide, I just, you know, I threw there some numbers um, about like total numbers about how many plants are there in the European Union, in the plants in, or vascular plants in Austria and so on. This is a rough estimate, but it's really hard to really say total numbers because we are lacking a lot of monitoring records. And also there is a gap of not to use um, monitoring tools so far, so we can really explore the full uh, set of biodiversity. Today with eDNA and other, I hopefully uh, quite promising um, um, methods, we will be able to track um, the full number of species. But as I said before, that's not everything. I think it's also worth um, focusing on different species. So monitoring records are somehow key to how somehow understand what forest uh, biodiversity or forest species richness um, exists of. And we are right now in the middle of an assessment, which is quite interesting to find out based on expert opinions, um, which species actually are um, forest dependent uh, 
optional forest dependent and not forest dependent, which is important because sometimes very policies track or aim forests quite excluded from landscapes or um, and, and with, with, with knowledge about those traits in, in those species groups, as you see here in those examples of uh, horn flies, um, we can then better understand which species really react to, I don't know, forest management changes, which species is actually, um, let's say, the, the habitat relies on more than just forests, or which species actually just occasionally occurs in a forest, but might not be dependent on it at all. So this is another step, which I would say is quite key when we talk on future um, forest biodiversity indexes and so on, which might be again picked up by different policies. And something that is probably already known very well among all the forest ecologists, it, uh, just, it's important to know at which stage and level and management stage you are. So because this also shapes again, the presence of different structural indicators as well as species indicators. Here you see a quite famous figure already. <laughs> in, re in red, you see those areas uh, which are the common, um, let's say European age classes. And then um, this, all the growth of all the forests are actually quite rare in, in Central European areas, which you might know. So, and, and what I want to show in this slide is that you see those lines and they really vary in depending uh, in what state um, or let's say age class that your, your forest is and what's the history of it, which is sometimes not so easy to define. We will we see this probably in, in another example. So why are forests so important for biodiversity in Europe? So 45%, according to the European Commission, are European, uh, are, are, for, are covered with forest or for sim or forest structure similar to forest or co tree cover similar to forest, let's say. And you can see that it's not evenly distributed, of course, across Europe, but uh, we have a very different, among European countries, a very different approach. Um, Austria, for example, almost half the country is uh, uh, covered with forests, uh, but about 85% of it is, for example, managed. So we have very different um, yeah, histories and that also shaped um, the today's forest cover. What I want to show now is a little bit about the forest development in Austria, because I think what's quite different, what's quite important to keep in mind when you work with forest biodiversity, that that's a result of an anthropogenic, um, let's say, inf heavily influenced ecosystem. Yeah? We, for another um, project, we were just uh, finishing on forest restoration. We did some historical analysis of 22 European countries. One of them uh, was done by uh, me and my team uh, in Austria. And we digged up the historic numbers of forest covers in the Austrian territories, which of course changed over time. I guess in the Czech Republic, the numbers might be similar due to a lot of um, timber, uh, need, for, need of timber for, for energy production. Um, it was the, 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 the forest cover was super low in the Alpine region. Uh, some say it's between 20 and 30 percent. I guess it's even, it was even much lower in, in, in other regions, which led to a lot of landslides and um, the afforestation to started about 1850 with the forest legislation, which again impacted um, then the, the ecosystem. So here again, we see like already a historical development of the, let's say, link to policies uh, responding to um, ecosystem degradation. Well, the afforestation continued and what you can see on this, this um, is not only the numbers of the tree covers rising, um, but all the tree species composition um, changing and you can see that sl slowly the numbers are also changing towards less conifers, more deciduous forests due to the latest um, bark beetle outbreaks in Austria, but also to other pressures on um, on Pizzea abies on the Norvis spruce, uh, which here, which has been, let's say, the plant in Austria <laughs> for, for, for over a century. So this is now changing. And like slowly changing according to um, the, the ecology of the country, let's say the, the, the surfaces 
of course, it continues to be, of course, one of the main um, tree species shaping. Um, I just want to say that this results um, shape also maps like this one from the European Forest Institute, showing us the most important tree species, the most important, or let's say this distribution of um, forest types and different uh, ecosystems. Uh, forest ecosystems, but we can expect that uh, linked to, to the changes, the rapid changes we see right now, and the ongoing efforts for uh, assisted migration, also these numbers will probably change in quite a lot of time. So that was a quick introduction <laughs> to forest um, biodiversity, but now let's focus a little bit on the European policy landscape. So um, forest ecosystem, as I said before, have a quite high relevance. Um, for a lot of sectors and also very strongly it's an economic resource it, uh, it's the income for 60 million uh, private forest owners with uh, <laughs> and turnover of 500 billion euros and quite a, a large share of employment offering to European population and that's not the main thing but also like the ecosystem functions uh, like provisioning um, or regulating uh, services uh, and the protective forest, uh, protective forest function, especially in the Alpine region, is actually something um, that is important um, to be picked up by, by a lot of policies. So forests are here quite interesting also in the last decade for the CO2 um, storage. So we have a lot of topics that are interested interesting for different uh, policy makers and very different sectors and that's why <laughs> forests um, let's say are then stuck a little bit between a lot of different agendas yeah and it's um, quite a work to harmonize all this <laughs> so the European Commission um, has launched um, the European Forest Strategy for 2030 for example so just, I don't know how familiar you are with the policy development, but policies uh, usually have like a strategy beyond. In this case, it's the European Green Deal. And with this, a lot of strategies are developed that might lead in some cases in the development of uh, legal papers, but all the guidelines or regulations. You, the, I think the key aspect of the forest uh, strategy for 2030 is that, um, that more trees should be planted. That's the 3 billion tree pledge uh, for 2030. And um, the recognition of, of um, multifunctional, um, let's say, the multifunctional role of forests. Um, I think a key of this strategy will be the upcoming um, monitoring, the harmonization of the monitoring of the European forest, which is quite a thing to bring into management practice <laughs> because every country has its own national forest inventory and their own um, ways to plan their biodiversity forest biodiversity monitoring. So this is definitely some a strategic challenge uh, for the next years. And um, of course, other regulations that go in line with this um, European strategy, like the deforestation free products covering other policies groups um, like uh, red plus and so on. So more linked to forest biodiversity, which is already a topic in a lot of these policies of the forest strategies, we have uh, the biodiversity strategy, which then uh, refers to many different ecosystem and uh, like in, in marine ecosystem and um, ecosystems like terrestrial ecosystems, but it refers and has quite an impact on forests as well. Uh, not only the, the nature restoration law, which you might have seen picking some like special ecosystem to be restored, but also the goals to protect 30% of the EU land and 30% of the seas and put uh, and to um, protect 10% of the land uh, with strict protection. And um, this is one of the parts of the biodiversity strategy, which is um, yeah, quite um, dominant in the work we do here at the at the Department for uh, Nature Conservation and Forest Biodiversity at the Austrian Forest Research Center because we are keen to find out. So we are inventing or we are trying to combine tools to find out um, where these areas could be, which should be under strict protection, how to handle it, 
uh, what's the form and so on. I'm going a little bit um, quicker through one slide here, but what I would like to demonstrate to close this chapter in this presentation is um, that policies have follow more or less a logic mostly. So um, there is usually some um, strategic problem. There is uh, research and conservation or um, let's say a conservation issue that comes up and it's picked up also um, either by the scientific community uh, as we know it from the different panels for biodiversity or for climate change or by NGOs even, or even by the member states themselves in the, Europe, in the case of the European Union. Uh, and then it goes into strategy development um, that can lead, if it's successful, to action plans and so on, uh, until it comes to implementation in this circle. And at this point of implementation, it's again, something where those, uh, let's say landscape ecologists or forest ecologists play, I think quite an important role because then these implementations um, have an impact on the forest ecosystem and this needs then to be kind of um, set into, an, into a monitoring agenda. And ideally, the <laughs> policy circuit closes, which is, yeah, from my experience, I have not experienced it so often that you really reevaluate what was done, what was successful, and then that you um, yeah, set the agenda again. So that's a never ending circle of policy. I think um, some quite interesting strategies, um, if, if you want to see it like from a more theoretical perspective. I would like to focus a little bit more on very recent policy, let's say development, which are based on the urge to, um, to respond to the biodiversity crisis. The European Red List is since uh, years um, using this uh, assessment um, scheme, which you might be quite familiar with, and um, pointing out that the biodiversity, that the species richness in Europe and the ecosystem richness is declining, and um, that there should be a policy respond or like a legal response to it, uh, which I think has been quite picked up. So in forests, uh, we identified in, in another, um, let's say, review um, 13 different um, reasons for um, threats to forest biodiversity that starts from landscape uh, fragmentation through um, loss of different forest types or replacement of native, um, native forest types uh, up to um, yeah, limitations in the soil biodiversity development. Um, some of them I'd like to um, look at a little bit further, especially to show you also some nice analysis from the um, environment, uh, European Environmental Agency produced on uh, fragmentation. So landscape fragmentation is kind of an, um, one of the key um, key reasons that, that um, forest that forest species or population um, are isolated and fragmented and um, that this um, the, the genetic diversity is getting lost and um, is also ranked as one of the major uh, threats to forest biodiversity. It's very strongly linked um, to climate change. As you can imagine, it's not only the change of precipitation and temperature, but also the increase of uh, like the the way how species are expected to shift. And this again, uh, this is also linked, uh, like climate change will also change tree species uh, suitability. So the climate suitabilities of different species, here you see um, Pizzea aves, Nova spruce, so and see how this will decline. Of course, in, in silviculture, this is an important information, but also for forest biodiversity, this information is important that uh, species communities will change and also um, change in their structure and in their, let's say, um, tree species composition and the associated biodiversity. Here you see the maps for uh, the beach, uh, the European beach, Fago Silvatica, also hers, uh, I think this, I don't know why I referred to her, but <laughs> uh, tree species, um, the climate suitability is decreasing. 
throughout the Alpine region. And um, those maps or the species distribution models are widely already available and should be a tool that should be considered when working with um, forest biodiversity. Then those changes in climate change have those indirect impacts. You all are familiar with the bark beetles, uh, bark beetle outbreaks, but also storms and uh, and other um, ex like so the distribution of invasive species and other pests and diseases. Um, cost here the statistics for Austria for um, the amount of of um, not harvestable trees. Um, actually uh, increased uh, like it did for the last years due to different um, biotic and abiotic threats. And one of those biotic threats are invasive species, which I would like to get um, to, into a little bit um, closer. And um, I mean, you probably are familiar with an alien species, invasive alien species are species that are arriving in a new area from different uh, from outside of this territory, usually from different continents, and which are harmful to the native species composition and uh, changing ecosystems. We have just now finished the distribution model for Amorpha fructicosa, <laughs> a shrub that is known in the south of, since the, the year 2000 or a bit longer in southeast, uh, spreading in the riparian areas in southeast um, Europe, but now um, really um, the in the increasing the occurrence rates and we can see a shift of the expansion towards more northern countries in different uh, climatic scenarios. So here again, we work with species distribution models in different scenarios. And I think that's probably not something um, promising if the species really occurs there um, is linked to a lot of other factors too, especially with invasive species. There is a huge human factor, let's say, that distributes those seeds. Um, but it's also a nice policy instrument uh, which where you can inform that this and the species might um, increase, um, might be important to be spread and prioritized. So we, there is also other tools like ICAP, uh, the Environmental Impact Categorization for Invasive Species developed by ICN, sorry for the typo, um, which categorizes um, and alien species into massive, major, moderate impacting species, so that the policy, let's say the, the, the species, the, the forest managers, the conservation managers on the ground know which species they should tackle first, which are the most har harmful ones. We did this exercise for um, the Mura Drava Danube um, yeah, Biosphere Reserve to find out which um, species are actually the most harmful and found a couple of fungi and plants, which have devastating impacts uh, on ecosystems, and hopefully then uh, started a discussion on which species is worth, um, um, is worth to be managed. Interesting is also the link between different threats. <laughs> so as I said, as you have maybe noticed in the sentences before, um, so one threat can impact another one, and then here, um, forest management plays also quite an important role in this intensity of the threat um, that um, forest biodiversity or ecosystem is actually exposed to. So that brings me now to management strategies, right? So we were then thinking, okay, so what are management strategies to improve the situation for forest biodiversity? in all these levels of structure, function, and species levels, right? And we identified based on 600 papers we read, and that was during the pandemic, so we had a lot of time. Um, and we uh, identified, um, we used indicators that uh, like species, we were looking for species indicators, which show, uh, which are representative for, for a species group or a species, um, or species richness, um, part of species richness. Um, and link them to um, indicators for management measures. So that means um, those measures or these factors that you in the forest can actually, uh, in the forest management, you can actually change, leading to management measures for the, con for the uh, biodiversity conservation in forest ecosystems. So this 
um, review letters then uh, to identifying those links between those three components, which was actually quite interesting to see when you want to, I don't know, if you increase the strength, the stand structure or the amount of dead mood, which species, which species group are you, are, is benefiting from it, right? And we found actually quite surprising results in the study, um, but uh, mostly it looked like, uh, so we were really able here, here's one more figure about it, um, to identify, so based on the studies, uh, we could then um, the, the perform a meta-analysis and see, okay, which species is actually really linked to this one indicator. And then we summarize those management strategies, which has been then picked up in Austria from um, different policy po policies or let's say even um, subsidy schemes um, as a possibility to evaluate strategies and so on. So here we were quite surprised um, about the policy impact this study had because we were actually just curious to see the links <laughs> between species and management indicators. And then we found um, those 14 management measures um, in, 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 in the synthesis of this um, analysis, like uh, providing more structural heterogeneity, increasing dead wood. So nothing that is really new, um, but listed in a list of 12 uh, management measures. A few of them I'm, I'm going to present to you quickly <laughs> because I'm running a little bit out of time if I'm right. Um, is one of them is, for example, to increase the tree species uh, diversity is a management measure for forest biodiversity um, and also discussed as a climate adaptation measure and um, probably some uh, like one one measure where different policies are in line, like also the climate adaptation and also the afforestation re uh, and regeneration policies are in line with this measure. Mm, and this can be what's interesting here is that it can be applied in different um, in different levels of, of from the stand level. Sorry for this in German, uh, up to the regional level. That has just one, let's say, technical um, remark. So a lot of increasing uh, a lot of afforestation in Austria and in many other European countries depend on artificial regeneration. So the seed supply needs to be um secured we are here at the department working on uh, um, the diversity the genetic diversity of uh, seed orchards so, um, so we are managing 24 seed orchards to provide um, diverse um, seed material for afforestation and here in the figures <laughs> you see uh, the, the demands for it um, the demands for um, yeah, the the traded um, uh, forest tree species. Um, so you see the demand is, is, is really high and to guarantee this supply is, is also like a matter of, um, yeah, again, a matter of um, link between those stakeholders responsible also to, yeah, ensure this, uh, this supply for, for future um, genetic diversity in the forest. Another one is the promotion or let's say provisioning of habitat structure. Um, so whenever there is more structure, there is probably also more species. Uh, that's at least one conclusion. Um, we we identified in several papers and here um, it's not only those structures which you might know, like the aquatic ecosystem or some um, structural element uh, of different landscapes, but we are promoting very much also this um, tree-related microhabitats, which are quite relevant. We are now conducting several studies to confirm more this link between um, forests, um, yes, the presence of different uh, forest species and the use of this tree-related microhabitats, which can be, for example, those, um, yeah, you see them here. Um, and we try to confirm more of this so that we can be more confident when talking to policymakers that for example, trees with a lot of tree trims, how they are called, stream rated microhabitats can then be subsidized uh, and um, be an, a valuable structure for a very long time. Another important and last management strategy I want to discuss in detail is the, to increase um, the connectivity for forest ecosystem, which can be done through uh, stepping stones or corridors. 
we have launched um, the first uh, national program on uh, forest connectivity in Austria, where we um, use contract-based uh, conservation um, actions for forest owners um, to set aside uh, or to offer to offer to us on a volunteer basis uh, or to nominate for, to the program areas which are um, beneficial for connectivity uh, and um, to um, subsidize the non-management measure uh, for 20 years. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, unfortunately for now only 20 years, so we'll see how this uh, will continue. Uh, we have installed around 1000 plots across Austria to do so. And also here we had first to develop a tool to identify which area is um, important uh, at, at all for, for um, so how do we prioritize and how do we identify those areas before we actually um, before we actually contract, let's say, the, the, these areas in the program. And we developed a prioritization model for it. Um, I could go more into detail if you want later to this one. Um, but I think what I want to show here is mainly that all this, the applied studies you do um, linked to the theoretical studies I think are from high importance for any conservation policies or uh, legal and um, non-legal um, instruments which can be developed on, on, on a, from another team, let's say. And we summarize it here. Um, I have summarized it here in another figure in the example for this uh, stepping stone program or connectivity program, um, how um, how many steps it actually includes. It includes the identification, prioritization of those areas. So the preparatory steps, like the, the financing, the evaluation, are as important as then actually the implementation of conservation uh, measures. And the monitoring, of course, then again, is, an, is another part to bring those um, programs into a long-term perspective. If, we've, if you really want to implement management strategies um, into a national nationally funded program, and um, it's useful to make a stakeholder map in the beginning to have an overview. So I think what I'd like to show today and maybe which we can discuss now is also that it's really important to talk about the results and to evaluate it uh, with a lot of different people to work as interdisciplinary as possible. That's no news, but still it's sometimes hard to do <laughs> because there's a lot of confrontation, different opinions. And I think it's important to suffer through these discussions and to really understand the point of view of other, uh, of other stakeholder groups, of other expert groups um, and to get some content. And uh, of course, and the third, which I'd like to say, and that's the last one, is that we really have to advance in, in monitoring tools and, and research tools and share this as we do this in our work as researchers. So uh, thank you very much. That was an overview only. <laughs> but if you want to know more, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and to have any further discussions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Very interesting.